Okay, here we go. Stand by. Three, two, one, action. Assume nothing. Brash, bald face, blasphemy. Question everything. I find it extremely hard to imagine. Open your eyes. It is quite all right to be an atheist. The fastest growing group of people in the country has been measured as being those who have no belief or who are atheists. You don't have to be apologetic or quiet about it. Challenge the opposition. You see religion on a hundred fronts losing the argument. And start thinking. This is The Thinking Atheist Worldwide. We've seen the protests on the street corners. We've seen them at military funerals. We've seen them at all kinds of events where they show up and with just a few people, a few dozen people, manage to become the topic of conversation for an entire nation. Holding up signs that say, God hates fags. Thank God for dead soldiers. Thank God for 9-11. God hates America. The Westboro Baptist Church, I try to picture it in my mind. You know, I've got this mental image of all these people, all these children growing up in an environment where this is normal. They don't know any different. To them, this is how it is. It's learned behavior. Becoming teenagers and eventually adults, having children of their own, all holding their picket signs, all spreading the message of hate. I was doing the preparation for the show, and I was thinking about that, and wanting to paint an accurate picture, doing the preparations. And then it occurred to me, my guest can speak to Westboro Baptist Church much better than I ever could. So I'll go right to the switchboard and say good evening to Nate Phelps. Nate, are you with me? I'm here. I've got kind of a mental picture of a mix between Jesus Camp and West Point. I mean, I mean, is that accurate? Well, you actually said several things there that, that hit it pretty much dead on. The first thing you said was that it was normal. And I think that's an important point to try to get across to people is that when you're growing up from, from the point, you know, from the moment you're born up through those formative years, uh, it doesn't really matter what the um, rhetoric is, what the ideology is. It is normal for you. So it's just kind of how you see that the rest of the world is. You talked about it being the cross between Jesus Camp and, and West Point. It's interesting because my father actually had a commission to go to West Point, which he turned down after he found God when he was 17 years old. But it was very much like that. He was, uh, was an absolute authority that no one could argue with, could you know, express their own opinions, even have their own opinions. Uh, it was reinforced with physical and verbal and emotional violence, all the while getting that very extreme, you know, what I call hyper-Calvinist ideology beat into our heads twice every Sunday, literally, like I said, from the, from the day we were born. There was no Sunday school. We sat in those pews, those same pews that you see in the documentaries, you know, straight through and for me until I was uh, 18 years old. So I'm trying to picture it in my mind. I mean, what's what's a typical dinner conversation like? I mean, you all sit around like a family, and and is every night a condemnation of the world you live in? You know, with with Fred Phelps at the head of the table banging his fist. I mean, what was it like? Yeah, no, there there was no such thing as dinner time there. I used to, to joke that my mom would, you know, be in there with three or four huge pots, you know, there were 13 of us, and she'd be stirring up, you know, some mass-produced meal. And at some point in that process, she would uh, get down on the ground, listen to, you know, put her ear to the ground, and then get up and run away as fast as she could, and then the herd would come in, right? wasn't quite like that, but it, there was never any real formal sit-down dinners. We just kind of came through and prepared the food ourselves and, and ate. So I would say the most organized time we ever had together as a family was in the pews on Sunday. Other than that, we were off doing whatever his bidding was. His teachings and preachings are really pretty accurate to what 
the Bible says. I mean, he takes a literal view. Many in the mainstream Christian community, they, they, you know, they go to Sunday church and they hear happy, happy, joy, joy sermons, right? But, you know, it could be argued that Fred Phelps is literally and probably more accurately teaching the Bible, huh? That's exactly right. That's, that's a frustration I have when I uh, read people's responses to, you know, what they see there with my family is uh, I am, I am almost as, uh, frustrated by comments like that's not the real God, that's not my God, that kind of thing, because it ignores the point, that very point that there's plenty of opportunity for the message that my father preaches to be crafted from the words that are in the Bible. Not that he got it wrong, it's just that he chose to focus on material that the rest of uh, mainstream Christianity doesn't want to focus on. You know, he takes great offense at that. I mean, I have to ask this question, and I hope I hope it comes out okay. But your father, Pastor Fred Phelps, is he a, a true believer? You know, is is he crazy? What makes that guy tick? I think I would I would answer all of the above. When I was growing up there, I can remember many a Sunday where he would be standing up at the pulpit and he'd have his fingers lovingly caressing those pages as he looked for a passage and he would get passionate and emotional to the point of tears as he articulated and anticipated a time when he would meet God. So I have no doubt in my mind that my father believes every word of what he preaches. I also think that there's something wrong with him. I think he's got you know, psychological disorder. I, I, I can't say what. I'm not an expert on that. But, um, so I think it's a little of both. What about your mom and all this? I mean, I think about, in my mind, I've got a picture in my head of this, you know, this quiet, kind of broken, beaten down, empty person who, who walks quietly, who talks softly, who comes and goes and mostly just tries not to cause any commotion or you know, be the reason for an outburst. You know, they're in the room, but they're really not in the room. I mean, is that is that accurate? Uh, I would say that she's completely under his thumb. You, you painted a very accurate picture. If you can just um, fill in the color with a man who's six foot two and a woman who's five foot nothing and, you know, less than half of his size overall. So that kind of clarifies the picture a little bit more and you know he he was apt to at the drop of a hat be physically violent towards her so she was just that person she was broken she was as much a victim as, as the children in that situation so in your opinion then well in your opinion what keeps your mom there is it that she knows nothing else? Is it that she is broken? Is she, does she secretly believe? Does she fear hell? I mean, what, why doesn't she just grab the kids and run? You know, I, I asked her that question several times when I was a teenager and she said, she, she just told me gently that I didn't understand. And she was right. I do know that when I was about five, that she packed all of us. I think there were 10 of us at the time into a car and drove to Kansas city and spent a couple of days at my at her sister's and eventually went back uh, I think you know when you're when you think about the early 60s a woman with 10 kids and no visible means of support you know what what choice did she have and she also grew up in an environment where you know her father was an alcoholic and was was violent so one can only imagine what that you know what message that left her with as far as her own worth so you talked about instances of abuse, and we're talking about emotional abu abuse and, and physical abuse. I mean, can you speak to the abuse that took place at Westboro? Rather than say that he was, he was abusive, I'd like to say exactly what he did so that people can decide for themselves. He used, he used what's called a mattock. Folks know what that is. It's a piece of wood. That, it's the handle of a, of a farm tool it's about four and a half feet long, and it's about 12 to 13 inches in circumference at the uh, business end. And he would swing that like a baseball bat at the kid's backside until they bled. 
Um, he used to grab the, grab us by our arms and lift us up and drive his knee into our stomach. He used his fists, bare and, and gloved, to hit us in the face and other parts of the body. When he was really raging, he would spit at us. So, you know, that's that was the behavior. And, you know, I'll let the, the listener decide whether that constitutes abuse or, or not. So, and he did that with the kids as well as with... Uh, with my mother now what number child are you are you are you a middle child are you on are you a, a youngest oldest pretty close to the middle i'm i have five older and seven younger siblings well for you then in your own mind and heart when did you really start to experience the fires of unrest Whew, that's a good question i mean you, you know you start out believing it all and then i think what saves you is kind of get this a uh, slow flame that grows into a, you know, like a really intense anger and wrath. And that kind of sustained me into my you know, early and then mid-teen years. I, I couldn't is- express it to him because it was dangerous. But I still had it and I still processed my own thinking, my own ideas in my head. And uh, then my older brother Mark left when I was 16 and a half. And when he succeeded in leaving, that uh, idea was born in my head. And I pretty much decided then that I was going to leave when, when I could legally. And the reason I had to wait till I was legally an adult is because my older sister had tried to do it when she was 17. And he brought her back and he beat her viciously for like three or four months until she turned 18 and then she left again. So to avoid that, I waited until my 18th birthday. So, all right, you got some kids leaving, but are there some who aren't going through the conflict? You know, they they bought it all hook, line, and sinker, and they're they're all in, and they're they're pledged. They pledged themselves to to continue the Westboro legacy. Well, I can't talk um, with complete authority about my uh, two youngest sisters and my youngest brother, but all the others except for Shirley was kind of the mouthpiece now, left for a time. And then uh, all but three of them eventually went back. Westboro Baptist Church is in the headlines, right? And we've all seen the sign, God hates fags. God loves dead soldiers. Thank God for 9-11. Just signs filled with vitriol. When you see those signs and you see the news headlines about the protests, what goes on in your mind? Well, that's, you know, that's been a journey. Uh, when I first saw it and heard about it, uh, it, was, it was a very fearful experience for me because it brought back issues that I hadn't really dealt with yet. And that was back in the early 90s. And, uh, but today when I see it, I just, I feel uh, sadness. I feel You know, like it's a horrible waste, absolutely inaccurate and destructive to the people that they're doing it to. But your heart must just break. I mean, all of our hearts break for these for the young children, right? I mean, it's almost like they never had a chance. I mean, you busted out, but you may be the exception to the rule. These kids are for them. This is normal. Sure. I mean, I. I know exactly what what that's like i know i also know that there's nothing that can be done for them unless there's a spark in them at first that takes them away from that situation and then i know that they're going to have years of uh anguish and processing and trying to figure out what's true and and what's not about the world they live in well nate can you just tell us tell me the story of the day you left westboro baptist church sure yeah, I had, uh, like I said, I had pretty much figured it out when I was about 16 and a half. And when I was um, 17, I had uh, found and bought a car that was about $300 and had hidden it. And then as the, as my 18th birthday approached, I was getting actually quite a lot of questions from my father about what my plans were. And I always denied that I intended to do anything but stay there and and uh, follow his guidance because I knew that it wasn't safe. So 
I slowly packed my belongings and hid them out in the garage and boxes. I probably had half a dozen boxes out there. And then on the night of my 18th birthday, I waited until everybody was asleep, went out and got the car and backed it into the driveway and rolled up the garage door and, and packed everything into the, into the trunk of it. And then I slipped back into the house and, and uh, walked through some of the rooms and uh, tried to calm myself down because I was so anxious about it. And then I walked into the kitchen, which the way the house is configured, the, the kitchen is a large room and there's a set of stairs that goes up to my father's room. And I stood at the bottom of those stairs and there was a clock off to the left of the stairs that uh, was on the wall above the three refrigerators we had. And I stood and watched that clock as it moved from 11.55 up to midnight. And when it hit midnight, I pumped my fist in the air and yelled at the top of my lungs and turned around and raced out of the house and and uh, jumped in the car and, and drove off. And I spent the first three nights away from home. I hadn't really planned anything beyond that. I just wanted to be away from there. Uh, I had asked a friend who, who managed the gas station if I could sleep in the gas station, and uh, he gave me permission. So I slept in the bathroom of the gas station for the first three nights until I found a place to live. And that's pretty much it. Are you feeling any guilt, or is this freedom, man? I mean... I mean, I left a mainstream faith, uh, and I, my, you know, I talk about, hey, oh, it's so hard to leave. My situation is nothing like you, you know, and it's still, I'm still wrestling for a while. I'm dealing with this chains and the fear of hell. I'm going to hell and all this yeah. stuff. I mean, are you still conflicted or are you done? Oh, I'm done now. But I, I, I remember vividly at the time in the few months prior to me leaving, I would sit at the, uh, in church on Sunday and I would. I was doing the calculations in my head that, you know, because he was preaching that God was coming back around the year 2000. And I'm satisfied, a large part of my mind is satisfied that, that he's got it right and I'm going to hell. Uh, so I'm doing the math and I'm figuring, okay, I can live, I can go out and live my life on my terms until I'm 42 and then I'll have to deal with God and, and hell and, and all that when the time comes. So there was that part of me. There was another part of me that literally felt like I had to leave or I would, I would die there. You know, do I mean physically? Well, there was a part of me that thought that was possible, but it was more the emotional. You know, I was literally dying in that environment. So sure, I had terrible fear and, and guilt, but you don't necessarily recognize it for what it is when, when you're at that point in your life. You just have these emotions and these... Um, Oh, how to say it, anxiety, you know, all that stuff is there, but you don't necessarily know the source of it. It feels just, you know, that's just who I am kind of thing. Right. So it took years to, to process through a lot of that and uh, get to the point where I could let go of, of that very visceral fear of, of physical burning and that kind of thing. Right. So I'm talking to Nate Phelps and I'm picturing in my mind on one side of the street is Westboro Baptist Church. And on the other side of the street is Nate Phelps. And do you ever go out and counter protest against the old family? You know, I was back in, in Topeka giving a talk. It's uh, been a little over two years ago now. I was back there, and and um, there was a documentary crew following me, and they ended up getting an opportunity to sit with my sister Shirley and, and several of my other siblings to get their side of the story. And they told me when they came back from that that Shirley had announced that they were going to do a picket in my in my honor at five o'clock that evening. So I ended up showing up there across the street to observe, and a few of them came across the street and tried to challenge me, and it turned into a you know typical uh, encounter with them where they're going to try to shout you down or or um, walk away. So. It didn't last long, but that's the only time I've ever been in a physical presence of one of their protests. Do you feel like, in your mind, do uh, does Westboro Baptist Church deserve 
constitutional protection? Do they have the right to do what they do, to say what they say, to go where they go? Yeah, that's a good question, Seth. I, I'm not. My opinion on that isn't isn't a popular one, um, especially this this recent uh, law that, that Obama signed. Um, it's brought that issue back up again. I my opinion on that is that it, we we are creating a false dichotomy when we say it's either they are protected by the Second Amendment or we trash. The Second Amendment. I don't think that's true. Oh, you mean the First Amendment's free speech? First Amendment. I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, it's been too much gun control talk lately. <laughs> <laughs> that's all right. I, I knew where you were going. It's fine. Yeah. But um, the way I see it, Seth, is that the, we have behaved since man has existed as though we have the right to bury our, our loved ones with a modicum of uh, peace and respect, and even though it's not enshrined in the Constitution, it is a right. So at the very least, we should see this as a question of competing rights. And I don't think that they that we trashed the First Amendment. I don't think that suddenly free speech is, is uh, dismantled. If we say simply that just as there are other restrictions on when and where, we should place a restriction on funerals, say not not now and not here. You have plenty of other opportunities to express yourself freely and openly, and and uh, have that protection of the First Amendment. So that's my position on it, and a lot of people disagree with me. <laughs> my, well, you know, anyone who logs on to the internet will see vehement disagreement. <laughs> on on every yeah. every single topic, so I, I I appreciate you speaking candidly about it. You are a non-believer today. Have you just walked away I, totally? I have indeed. Yeah, I'm, and I'm very comfortable with that position now. Do you use the word atheist? I do. I use the word atheist. You know, some people want to say, "Well, now you're just saying that you believe absolutely in something that you can't prove." Well. Maybe technically, if you want to, you want to define atheism that way. I think that when enough information or not enough information reaches critical mass, that we can safely say or safely argue a certain position uh, without fear of contradiction. So, I mean, if if you want to say technically we can't know for sure, okay, but there's overwhelming evidence that it's nonsense. And I'm going to stick with that position until something else comes along that proves proves otherwise. Yeah, I think we're going to probably end up doing. I've I've, I've resisted Nate doing the whole atheist versus agnostic, or you know, are you an atheist agnostic? Everybody, everybody's having the debate. What do you label yourself as? And I took the harder line atheist because, quite frankly, in my mind, a benevolent, omnipotent, omniscient deity would have already done something godlike. <laughs> and so, yeah. you know, anything's possible. I always say when people say, well, you can't disprove a god. I'm like, well, I, you know, I think there's a, a giant pink plush uh, monkey suction cup to the back of Jupiter's moons. I can't disprove it. It doesn't mean that that's a reasonable assumption for the rest of us to make. So, yeah, I mean, I totally get you. You just say atheist. And now, right, you've opened the door for everybody who didn't come from an extreme church. They come from the kind of church that I was raised in, the Kumbaya church, where everybody's talking about the love of Jesus and John 3.16 and baptizing the kids on Sunday nights and all that. And they come to you and they say, well, Nate, you just did it wrong, man. I mean, you, you weren't raised in a, in a real church that displayed love. No wonder you're screwed up. Your atheism is a result of the fact that you were in an abusive situation. You never really experienced Jesus. I'm sure you've heard this. Sure, I have. And I, and I reject it outright because like so many other arguments, it completely ignores the facts. And that's what's frustrating to me is that, you know, when someone wants to start talking about, well, you're just as bad as your father. And, and, uh, like you, the argument you pointed out, you know, none of that addresses the question of whether the evidence is sufficient for the claim. You know, the way I look at it, yeah, of course that environment put me in a unique position but the unique position was that I was motivated 
to find out the truth. And ultimately, the evidence is what convinced me which direction to go. It's sort of like being in the desert and, and then drinking water for the first time. You open those books you never knew existed by scientists you'd never heard of, hearing arguments you were never exposed to, and you can't get enough. Did you just dive in head first? Like, where have I been? Where have these people been? Well, it was it's so funny you say that because for years I was asking the questions. I was going to the leaders. I mean, I was I was going to the leaders, Seth. I was out in, in Southern California and Focus on the Family was out there then and the Calvary Chapel system was out there. And I was searching out the people who should know these answers. And I was getting more and more frustrated. And quite frankly, I was surprised at how little they could provide when you just asked the pointed questions. But didn't realize that in my search, I kept going back to their books. You know, I'm reading the evidence that demands a verdict and, and um, you know, stuff by uh, John MacArthur and, and these guys in that Calvary system. And then one day I picked up Michael Shermer's The Science of Good and Evil, and it was exactly like that. I, I would read a chapter or a couple pages, and I would jump up and run downstairs and I'm just just almost screaming at my wife, oh, you got to see this stuff. This is exactly what I've been thinking. You know, I was just so excited about it. And it wasn't until years later I realized that was the first time I had ventured outside of the fold, so to speak. Picked up something that wasn't designed to maintain the indoctrination. You're a big uh, advocate today for... for um gay rights can is this yeah. therapy for you is it a, a chance to maybe undo some of the damage being done is where does what drives that yeah i mean it was when i started talking about it and and i'm getting letters from people who grew up in similar environments i'm getting letters from people who were abused in general and i'm hearing from a lot of people from the gay community and it got to the point where i realized you know these people basically have had the same experience i had just on a different issue you know, they've been marginalized and mistreated. Um, I get it. I understand what they're going through. And what better issue to focus on considering what my family was doing. So, and and it's, it's the issue of the day, if you think about it, as far as social justice. So um, that's kind of what was motivating me. Your website, natephelps.com, says that you are a speaker and author on religion and child abuse. You deal specifically with abuse in what, religious situations or overall? I mean, how are you active today? Well, yeah, most of that uh, talk about as far as abuse has, has focused on the kind of situation that I grew up with. But I'm starting to spend more time on, on uh, the question of, of um, these groups. You're probably aware of this, Seth, but you know most of the states in the United States have a law, or have written into their laws about child abuse, that if it is done with a religious motivation, folks get a pass. So you've got young kids dying because the parents use prayer instead of, uh, you know, the local hospital or the local doctor to cure their children. Um, actually going to be in the Kansas City area in October to give a talk on that. So um, kind of branch it out in that area. Uh, other than that, I'm talking about religious-based abuse, both physical and, and emotional and, and psychological. How are you doing? I mean, how many years has it been since you left? Well, I'm going to give up my age, aren't I? Well, just give me years. a round number. <laughs> you know, is it over? <laughs> It's been 35 years. All right, and I would say I'm doing, I'm doing very good today. I mean, you got joy in your um, life. You got people around you who love and support you. You don't live in fear. I mean, or do you carry any baggage? Are you still dealing in, in some way, or, or right now are you full bore down the road of helping others? Yeah, I, I don't think you ever get rid of all of it. I think you just learn how to manage it, uh, and I'm doing that very well. Uh, Growing in leaps and bounds these last five years because of this process I'm going through and, and talking about it and have an opportunity to, to meet other people who've had similar experiences and, 
and process through that. So uh, I, I feel like I'm doing very well right now. Nate Phelps, before I go to the phones, uh, you, you can't give me a definitive answer. I just want your gut. Are, are you, is, is Westboro going to be around in five years, 10 years? I mean, will they ever go away? Will they always be in our headlines? Will there always be 40 or 50 people who show up and stir the shit storm and, and spread negativity the specific way that they do? Do you think they'll ever just give up, die off, go away? Well, I think I've said for the last couple of years that, that, from some of the stuff they've said and, and what I learned growing up back there, that they seem to be playing some kind of an end game. Um, you know, they talk about Obama being the antichrist and that he only had 42 months before he was going to be um, taken off the throne. Well, it's not some kind of heaven's and, gate deal, right? It's not going to be something. Well, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't think that. I think that they expect that Christ is going to come back. Um, of course, July 21st last month was the 42nd month for him. And, and I made an issue of that and, and they denied it, even though there's, you know, there's video of Shirley saying that stuff. Clearly they had some expectation that something was going to happen and they continue to have that expectation. That's the, the reason for the focus on the Jewish people right now is they think they're supposed to be helping call out the 144,000 Jews which is a necessary precursor to Christ's return. And uh, so, and they also talk in terms of, they don't believe that any of them are ever going to die, that Christ will return and none of them will feel the, the sting of death. Have they so, read the New Testament? You know, I, that's the thing that drives me crazy, Nate. You know, I there are some among you who will not see death to his disciples. And that was 2000 years ago. Do they not do they, are they living in, in, do they, do, if they take the scriptures literally, how did they miss that one? You know? Well, they take the scriptures. Well, that's an interesting question because for years I said, my family, my father interprets the Bible literally. And now I realize he interprets the Bible, his literally, because you're right. As soon as you start looking at some of the passages, he ignores his theology, like so many others just fall apart. Um, but he spent a lot of time in Revelation, and, and then he tied that back to uh, to Daniel and, and uh, Elijah, and the uh, they they believe that they've got it all figured out, as does every other group out there that tries to focus on this stuff. Yeah, everybody holding an apologetics conference this weekend in some part of the world has it figured out, and they all disagree with each other. To the, those on the switchboard, I promise and, and I'm they, coming. I promise I'm yeah. coming. I have got to, I've got to go back. Fred Phelps, your dad yeah. honestly believes and Barack Obama, our president is the antichrist. Well, that's what Shirley was out there preaching that, you know, when he was inaugurated the day of his inauguration, they were at the white house and they were saying he, he was the antichrist and he had 42 months before his reign was taken away from him. And that's, you know, there's, there's Bible for that as far as the antichrist, not for, not the Bible for Obama, but, um, but at some point, one of them is going to die. Likely it's going to be my father or my <laughs> mother. Yeah. And when that happens, they either have to decide that God was angry and punished them and that, you know, my father and that he's going to hell or what does this mean? Now, of course, the great disappointment, the, the Millerites suggest that that just made the religion stronger, but I have to believe that at some point this thing weakens, especially once my father passes. I think about the waste of life. You know, these young children and the teenagers and the relationships, the marriages, the siblings. I think of all the time and energy wasted on just the negative, the spewing of vitriol, the division. And, and it, it just hurts me. I can't imagine what you think and feel. But I think what a travesty. You know, if these if if. They had taken a tenth of the energies that they had taken into protesting the funerals of men and women who served their countries <laughs> and celebrated them. You know, th think of the, the force for good they might be. Even as a religious organization, at least they could do something positive. It, it breaks your heart. It, you know, Seth, you're a man after my own heart. Those were almost exactly the words I used at the Reason Rally. 
the tremendous waste of, of resources and the horrible harm that it does in the in the best case scenario, these young people will escape there and they will spend the rest of their lives struggling with the lies that were hardwired into their minds when they were young children. And it's you're right, it's heartbreaking. It absolutely breaks my heart to think of the waste and what they could have done with with that kind of capacity because they really are a, a bright bunch of people. Isn't that funny? I mean, you think about it. Yeah. There's this dividing line where all of a sudden, normally what would be reasonable people do the most crazy, batshit, unreasonable things. It's just <laughs> welcome to yeah. religion. Nate, do you have time to take a couple of calls here? I'd love to. Let's go to my first caller, 513. Thank you for your patience as I sort of hog the conversation. You're on the Thinking Atheist podcast. Who's this? That's Mario. Mario, glad you waited. What do you have for us? Well, my um, my first encounter with the Westboro uh, folks was uh, I, I was doing some work, uh, you know, studying with um, Thunderfoot, and I ran across the the YouTube where he interviewed. You remember that? I think they were protesting, and did he go up and? No, he no, he actually went there to the church. I haven't seen by it. himself. Really? Oh, you got to do it. I I. First of all, I was I was impressed that he would do this alone. <laughs> but he he was there with the mom and two of the girls, and they were just sitting at a table and they and they were debating, and and she she just leveled him. I mean, <laughs> oh my gosh, um, you know he he can hardly get a word in edgewise. She leveled um, him with content, or she leveled him with just sheer verb with volume. Well, both, uh, because, for example, uh, you know, Thunderfoot would uh, make some sort of a statement and she would immediately start quoting the Bible. You know, and, and well, let, let me make one thing that Nathan said, which uh, got me thinking. And, and I think this is interesting because um, I have a, a good friend, uh, an older woman who's a Christian and uh once uh, I mentioned, well, you know, in the car, I said, hey, you know, have you ever checked out the, the, those Westboro people? And she said, oh, they're crazy. They're absolutely crazy. And I said to her, well, you believe the Bible? And she said, oh, of course. I said, I've not heard anything coming from their mouth that was not biblical. Okay, so she just, she, she just called them crazy, but the Bible's okay. But, you know, I, they, but they use the Bible correctly. That's the irony. You know what I'm saying? I appreciate that very much. Did you have a qu another question or comment for Nate? Are you, you good? Uh, I, let me ask him about his um, uh, child abuse. Um, how, how long did it take to, you know, to discern the damage done? And how did you confront it? Well, that's, that's an interesting question. Um, I, I kind of liken it to an onion, Mario, in that, you know, you, you can recognize some of the issues almost immediately. And then something will come along in your life where you, you suddenly discover that you hold a belief that uh, harkens back to something that happened when you were growing up. And you have to now reconsider that belief, dismantle it, and then decide whether it's based in reality or whether it was just something that was told to you without any evidence. Um, I, I went through that process both with the things that we were taught as well as, as with the things that I um, took in based on the, the physical violence. So um, interestingly enough, I actually, when I had my own kids, uh, started out believing that somehow I was doing them some spiritual harm if I excluded corporal punishment from um, my, you know, my fathering. So it wasn't until my youngest boy was about two or three years old, and I had crafted a process that was was what I considered 
less destructive, you know, that would get the point across without creating a lot of fear and, and creating the idea that I didn't love him. And I'm talking to him before I spanked him, and he's shaking violently. And I asked him why he was scared, and we had a conversation. And I came away from that making, I made the decision that I was going to no longer ever touch my children uh, as part of my, my uh, parenting. And it was like, suddenly I realized that I was holding this idea and I had to let go of it. And the world opened up to me as far as the opportunities and the options I had for raising my children in a more balanced way. So it, it, it was literally a lifelong process. Mario, thank you very much for the call. Very much appreciated. Nate, do you ever look in the mirror? I just have this visual of you looking in the mirror and you're saying and you're saying it out loud. I am not my father. That ever happen? Oh, all the time. I am yeah. not my father. I just, you know, I mean, it's 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 got to be something that goes through the the mind of every child who is unhappy with the way that a, a parent acts and yet knows they share DNA in a very, very big way. <laughs> you know? Yeah. yeah. Uh, let's talk to okay. 630. You're on the Thinking Atheist podcast. Who's this? This is Drew. How are you, Seth? I'm doing good. Drew, what do you have for us today? All right. Well, um, I graduated from a very small liberal arts college in my town, and they, uh, part of what they called Anti-Hate Week, showed a, a film called uh, The Anatomy of Hate, which focuses a little bit on Westboro. And Westboro, I guess, got wind of this, and they were going to show up to protest uh, on campus. So we, as a student body, decided that we were going to do a counter-protest. And instead of, you know, going, oh, we hate you, get out of here, you know, we, because that's kind of being, you know, intolerant to the intolerant, there was about like 300 people that uh, got uh, to the embassy, to the epicenter of campus, and we all just shouted, you know, we're in our central land we love. We're in our central land we love. And, you know, um, the funny thing is they never showed up. So you, what, you're, you're just having your own counter-protest against nobody or <laughs> what? Well, they... They said that they were going to um, come and protest the screening of the film, and they're famous for, you know, saying that they're going to show up somewhere, and in some cases they do show up, and some some cases they don't. I, you know, I I don't really, I don't really know. I mean, we did look kind of, we did look kind of foolish, you know. Standing up there against uh, you know nobody, but we did. Uh, but in some ways, we didn't because you know that was our just way of saying you know we're not gonna stand for this hatred. Yeah, you went public and did something and said something positive. That's that's cool. Anything else for us? Nope. All right. Appreciate the call. Thanks for Thanks being a part of the show. Very, very much. 402. You're on the Thinking Atheist podcast. Do you have a comment or question for Nate Phelps? Yes, sir. Seth, my man, I'm glad you're back. Good to be back after you, a month of technical I you took difficulties. The, uh, the, the Mars rover, you've been gone so long. <laughs> well, a lot happened since the computer melted down. But I know. But, but we we're back. We're live. World, yeah. We're nationwide. We're worldwide. What do you have for us? Oh, yeah. Um, well, I was a neurology major in college. And around 16 is when the Westboro Baptist Church kind of popped up after 9 11. And I've just always been fascinated with what 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 makes that belief in stick in people and not like seriously Nate you are like one of my heroes because like your story is really pretty awesome because I had a kind of similar experience where it was it wasn't like physically abusive but it was kind of emotionally and verbally and with uh, charismatic parents and it was just questioning that would get you the smackdown. So, uh, yeah, no, I just really relate to your story, and that's just really cool hearing it from you. But um, 
uh, researching it in college, there's a, I don't know if you've ever heard of Bob Altmeyer. He's a psychologist in Manitoba University, or University of Manitoba. Mm -hmm. um, the, 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 the profile, I don't know if you've ever heard of a authoritarian personality. But uh, familiar with it. Yeah, I think Nate may be familiar with the concept of an authoritarian. Yeah. Yeah, but it's just this, you know, doing looking through the research that he he's done over like starting in the eighties and and just the, the the profile that you build, it's just like uh the the common denominators of people wanting a mighty leader or a religious figure to destroy the radical new ways and sinful that are ruining us, and uh, our country will be destroyed someday if we do not smash the perversions eating away at our moral fiber and traditional beliefs. It just, that seems one of the uh, core underlying uh, themes to this all. So, yeah. um, I, the question I wanted to uh, ask Nate was, what is the best strategy to countering this? It seems like they just uh, need attention. Like they just they crave it. They they seek media attention, and they're the more outrageous they are, they know that the more attention they'll get, and it'll perpetuate. And that's why they're going on these talk shows and screaming at people. I feel like if they were just ignored, or at least you know tuned out slightly, and people didn't you know yeah, that's a good cover question. them on the front I mean, page. That's a good question. I mean, I mean, that's, mean, that's what they need. Are you, by stirring the pot, by going out and making the headlines even more intense, are you giving them what they want? At the same time, if they go out and protest unanswered, uncountered, that seems even more of a travesty. What's your take, Nate? Well, yeah, that's actually a very good question. It kind of uh, spins off of that last caller. Um, you know, theoretically, if somehow we could magically figure out how to just turn them off, that would probably be, be the best way. But it's just not going to happen. It's not human nature. Um, so what I've seen to be far more effective is to take that negative approach. You know, I've talked about this a lot, that you know, they, they're they valuable to society because they show us the extreme face of hate. And they give us the motivation to go out there and to put up a human wall around people that are, you know, burying their loved one. You know, they put flags up. There's, there's all of these different uh, counter protests that go on like that fellow was talking about. And it, it no longer has to be about Westboro Baptist church. It can be about the behavior, you know, the goodness that can come out of, of humans when they figure out how to come together and express support and love. It's amazing so, how creative people have gotten too. you know, there's a little town in Oklahoma that there's a military service member that died and Westboro was coming out to protest the funeral and a bunch of bikers, motorcycle riders went over. It was totally nonviolent. They just all made a huge circle around, you know, and Westboro, anytime they'd start shouting hate, the bikers would just rev the engine a little bit, <laughs> you know, totally drowned them out. They lasted 15 minutes and went home. And it was sure. beautiful. It was beautiful to see it happen. Yeah, there was, uh, there was one down in Texas where they were protesting at a uh, Jewish community center. And so they figured out how to um, do a fundraiser, you know, people... Uh, committed to paying a certain amount of money per minute to, that the protesters were there. And they uh, accumulated enough money to to buy a, a new ice maker for the community center, and they put a plaque on it that says something about the Fred Phelps Memorial Hell Frills Over Ice Machine or something like that. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, they get pretty creative. That's brilliant. Hey, man, thanks for the call. I, I do appreciate it. I, I have to think humor is one of my favorite counter pro to, to see the signs. People are so creative. One guy had a sign that he said, I thought about Shirley Phelps naked. Now I'm a homosexual and I laugh. Now I feel bad for Shirley, obviously, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but you see God hates signs. Um, yeah. you know, they, they bring, they bring their pets out. Um, 
uh, there was a couple of uh, one guy had a big plastic bag that was white and he put in a black magic marker. God hates plastic bags or God hates fuzzy kittens or God hates whatever part of the world. Or, I mean, it, people have gotten so God hates figs. And yeah. uh, and then they go stand right next to Westboro. And it just seems in my mind, it just seems to suck all the wind all out of their sails because they've gone from being this vitriolic, angry, crazy thing to to a punchline, to a reason that I just find myself just smiling. And uh, I don't know if you feel, do you have the same reaction or, or, I mean, what do you think? I do. That's exactly how I feel. I find it humorous. I was driving down, a, a, we have what's called the red mile here in, in Calgary. A lot of not, nice shops, you know, people show up there often on Fridays and Saturday nights. And I turned, you know, there was a bookstore there and I see this uh, like canvas bag for carrying your books in. And, and it's, decorated with you know similar colors like my family's signs and it says god hates bags i just thought that's just amazing that you know how <laughs> how much it has proliferated in our society right but i, I just, think it's wonderful the, the humor the signs the the ideas that people come up with to to counter their voice i yeah, love it i mean they're a meme machine they they just have sort of created a monster that they probably never even intended. Uh, well, seven. Yeah, you know, what, oh, I'm sorry, Nate, go one ahead. Other thing, one other thing I wanted to say was I was up in Edmonton a year and a half ago and was talking to a, a, a group that had, had gathered there to counter protest and was talking about this question of, you know, what value do they have? And one of the things I said near the end of my talk was, you got to realize that you guys showing up out here, there were two or 300 people there that showed up to kind of protest. And there's a young person who's standing on the periphery of this or, or who's hearing about this. And they're realizing that in spite of this, all of this negativity out there about homosexuals, is here's 300 people coming out here to say bullshit. I'm not accepting it. I'm not going to tolerate that kind of attitude towards certain members of our society and what kind of positive impact that has on that young child. So, you know, I mean, there's a lot of good that you can take from what they're doing. Another one that pops into my mind is they've always got those multicolored signs. And there's one that says, for homophobic protesters, your signs are pretty gay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let me go back to the switchboard here. We've got a few more minutes. 727, thanks for waiting on me. You're on the Thinking Atheist podcast. Who is this? Hey guys, this is Conrad. Um, I actually go by the pseudonym of Giordano Bruno on Facebook, and I'm proud to say that Nate has accepted my friend request, and I follow his posts and his status updates, and I know a lot about him. And I do have a question for Nate, but if I may make a brief statement to you first, Seth, if that would be okay. Knock yourself out. Well, my ex-girlfriend is about your age and had a almost identical upbringing. And about 2008 is when she started getting out of the bubble and removing the blinders. Last year, I sent her a copy of your speech that you gave at the Oklahoma Free Thought Convention. And she was blown away. And essentially her comment to me was she found the parallels in your life and hers to be virtually identical. Uh, things even like when she was transferred from public school to private school and why, and having to watch movies like A Thief in the Night and how they still haunt her to this day. And whereas a lifelong atheist might, like myself may glom onto guys like Harris and Dawkins and Hitchens, she has really taken a shine to you because she feels she has a comrade in arms. Whereas I might be there to support her in her transition, I don't have the same experiences, whereas you do. And she really enjoys your videos, her podcasts, and I just wanted to thank you on her behalf for being there, perhaps coincidentally, by having that parallel life at the same age, same point, same change, same everything. But you've really been a great help to her and her transition out of that into reality and i just wanted to thank you for that man you give that woman a great big hug from me i'll tell you i just want to re it's uncanny how our timelines really did kind of line up i mean i was sort of in la la land i checked out after 9 11 i i just didn't really think or about it or care 
But around 2008, I was at critical mass and to hear that, and I'm probably, Nate and I, you can back me up on, on this, Nate, if you agree, but when I started doing what I do with the Thinking Atheist website, my number one thing outside of just wanting a chance to connect with those of like mind was I hoped there was somebody out there who was going through something who would take encouragement from my story and from the videos and from the shows and having a Facebook page and to hear that somebody heard, uh, you know, a speech and, and it resonated with them is the greatest feeling for me. I mean, Nate, you probably feel the same way. Like I, I want to make this better for the next person born inside of Westboro. Right. Yeah. That, that is the motivation. Yeah, and, and it really was, it, it, it was a huge help and the, the parallels, um, are, are, as you say, un, uncanny as, as she presents it to me. And I'm really glad that means a lot. Uh, but in a similar vein, and this is my question for Nate. One thing I don't know about you, Nate, and I'm sure you know who Lauren Drain is. Um, so my question is, uh, have you ever had any contact with Lauren uh, when she broke away from the West Barrow Baptist Church? I've seen the video of the way her father has essentially utterly rejected and disowned her. And I was always wondering if you've ever had any contact with her. And if so, were you able in any way to, to, to be a support system for her or help her in her transition out of the Westboro Baptist Church? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. First of all, let me say, I, I certainly recognize the name Giordano Bruno and see your uh, posts regularly on Facebook. So I know exactly who you are. Um, Thank you. As, as far as Lauren goes, um, it's an interesting question because one of the things that happens when you grow up in an environment like that is so much attention is focused on those who have left. They become kind of a symbol of everything evil. Um, you know, when you discuss some idea of some uh, degeneration of society, it always comes back to some evidence that they can point to in the life of one of the people that have left. So what ends up happening is the people who do leave, they leave for their own reasons and they believe that their reasons are valid, but they don't necessarily believe yours were. And she, you know, Lauren doesn't know me. Um, I've had uh, five or six of my nieces and nephews who've left and a few of them have, have, uh, responded to me when I reached out and I've developed a relationship with them. A few of them, you know, they, they hold on to those stories, even though they've never met me and they're scared at the very least they're scared at the worst. They think I'm evil. Um, specifically to answer your question about Lauren, I've reached out to her several times and haven't gotten a response one way or another. So I don't push too hard in that, in that area because I understand that dynamic. So I'll, I'll leave it alone. And Maybe she's at one not. Point, I'm sorry. What's that? Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Well, so, yeah, I mean, uh, certainly I would love to have a conversation, have an opportunity to, to uh, have a relationship with Lauren and to be a support for him. And, and that's yeah, what I've offered. Interject. Maybe she's not. Um, maybe she's not ready yet, or 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 just you know. Again, what you just explained a moment ago, people's psychologies are so different, and maybe she just wants to completely distance herself from that to the point where, you know, she, even somebody who may have experienced it before her is not something that she necessarily wants. I mean, I'm just curious about the psychology of it. I think she just got engaged and she's planning a family. Well, I mean, but, the circumstances um, I probably are as, once I heard her as complex as the personalities and individual scenarios for each person. Everybody's got their own thing. So who knows what, what she's carrying with her. But uh, that's certainly something for us to keep our eyes and ears on. Thanks for the kind words. Anything else before I move on? Uh, no, nothing else I can think of. It's just been an honor talking to you guys, and uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you. Take care, Jordana. So, Take Nate, care. are there sermons about you? Fred Phelps is preaching oh. your name as evil, as an agent of Satan, as a bad— You know, this is what happens when somebody allows the devil in. Is that going on? Well, no, I haven't been there, so I can't say with 100% certainty, but I know what happened when Mark left. That's all we heard about for the last year and a half that I was there was how evil he was and how he's, here's the evidence, here's the proof that all the things I said about 
that evil universe or that evil world out there. And now it's happening to your, your, uh, your brother. And, uh, that's why you need to stay here. You know, God, but Satan has his grips on, on him now. And, uh, all we can hope for is to, you know, we've delivered him to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that is spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord, that kind of talk. Right. So, and I do know when I gave a talk in St. Louis a while back that, uh, a news reporter who had had interviewed my uh, father and, and several of my siblings just days prior to me coming there uh, said at one point in the interview, he said, you got to understand that your family, they really hate you. So, yeah, I think it's a pretty good guess that those sermons are being preached hot and heavy back there. I'm, I have this picture in my mind, Nate, of the movie The Village, where they're all... Yeah. In the walls, no one ventures beyond, you know. I would like your permission, Father, to go to the towns to fetch medicines, <laughs> you know. Yeah. I just have this. Yeah. Is that is that an accurate analogy? No, actually, it's not, Seth. I mean, they're, they're out there in the world. They're, they live in the community. They, they uh, interact with the folks there in Topeka, of course. You've got to imagine it's a pretty strained interaction at this point. Yeah, but mentally, um, intellectually, emotionally, when you go out somewhere else, you, you are still at Westboro. Yes. You are. Yeah. You're, you're, you're you closed off, right? You you are there certain things you don't do. You certain people you don't speak to. You probably don't go to the movies. I mean, what? Well, not not with our father knowing it, we didn't. That was another thing that was so peculiar about growing up there is that. You know, we had the opportunity to be away from that environment often enough that we did a lot of things that he prohibited. Um, he just never knew about it. So there was that learned deception was another part of growing up in that environment. And in that case, some teenage rebellion did you some good, man. <laughs> you know, I'm glad Absolutely. I'm glad you got to go out and taste taste of those tainted waters. 831, right. you're on the Thinking Atheist radio podcast. Thank you for waiting. Who's this? This is Ray Bailey in California. Glad you called, Ray. What do you have for Nate today? I just want to say hello to you and hello to Nathan. And uh, I, I was a Jehovah's Witness, and uh, like Nathan, that was a religion that was kind of based on the Millerites, uh, 1844 uh, prediction of Armageddon that led into the Second Adventist, which then split into several groups, and Jehovah's Witnesses being one of them. And uh, ironically, they also had the 144,000 thing and and very close society. So I understand uh, much of what he went through when he was in there. So, But my question to Nate is, when you left the church, did you try going to traditional Christian churches, or did you just completely abandon religion altogether? Oh no! I spent I spent uh, a good part of 20 years. Uh, well, the first five or eight years that I left, I I was terrified of anything anything religious. I avoided it all like the plague. Again, believing that I was you know going to hell. So um, then I, when my kids were born, I actually started attending a mainstream uh, evangelical free church. And uh, also spent time in the, the Calvary system there in, in uh, Southern California. Um, and during that time, I was I was an outspoken apologist for mainstream Christianity, um, trying desperately to believe and hold on to that belief. And uh, so that was the path I took. And it was in that environment that I finally started asking the tough questions and challenging it and got to the point where I finally let go of it. Well, you walk into a mainstream evangelical free church, it's got to be wildly different than what you grew up with. You, you probably like going to a foreign country. Well, you know, yeah. And that's one of the reasons why when people say, well, you grew up in this horrible environment. Well, perhaps, but I spent years seeing the kinder, gentler side of Christianity and enjoying it. I mean, I had some tremendous friends that I made when I was going to that EV Free Church um, who are still friends today. Um, but one of the problems that I ran into is if I'm listening to these preachers, you know, putting out the kinder, gentler John 316 Jesus on Sunday morning, I'm hearing my father's voice in the background saying, how can any man who's dead 
accept anything, you know, that, that whole Calvinist ideology. So certainly that affected my perception of what I heard pre- preached at those mainstream churches. Anything else for us before I move on? Uh, that's uh, that's pretty much what I went through when I left uh, the Je- Jehovah's Witnesses. All of the self-help books, all of the ex uh, witnesses, for, um, I mean books, but written by ex witnesses, all of them, we you know, were told you how to get out of the Je- Jehovah's Witnesses, but they told you to go to the traditional churches as a replacement. Right. There was nothing that told you just to abandon religion altogether. And like sure. that, I had to go to a regular Christian churches and, like you, pose the tough questions, and then finally to say, you know, it's all BS. Yeah. So I'd like, I'm wondering, were you then, are you having to deal with being ostracized once you left that church? Oh, yes. I was very active. They read my my disassociation notice in several congregations, and I had to go through the uh, problem with my three kids. Uh, Fortunately, my two younger daughters have uh, left the religion. My son is still in it, but my ex-wife was telling my kids that I was going to be destroyed in Armageddon, so it was my weekend for the kids. You know, my five-year-old was always crying, saying, Dad, I don't want you to die in Armageddon. You know, can you come back to the Kingdom Hall? And it just took a long time to get that out of the uh, equation toward, toward now. They don't even go at all. So, But, yes, uh, I, all the people I knew during that time, uh, none of them are allowed to speak to me. And when I see them in the grocery stores, they turn around and walk down the other aisle or, or go, all the, you know, go away altogether. Yeah, it's a pretty powerful tool to get people yes, to it conform. Is. Yeah. I well, appreciate your call. I'm, I'm glad to. Uh, I'm glad to hear of another story of somebody though who's. Uh, I'm still, still a little, little bit stuck on. They read your dissociation letter in front of it, the whole church body. Yes, uh, like I a public condemnation. Elders, yes, yes. To, to, well, I didn't want them harassing me because if you just quit going to meetings, eventually, you know, they'll they'll because I was a ministerial servant or like a deacon, so they start, you know calling you and harassing you. and I just didn't want them bothering more, so I just wrote a letter saying, you know, as of today, uh, September 1st, I no longer want to be known as one of Jehovah's Witnesses, and please, thank you very much, take me off your rolls. Well, they re- they announced that into the congregations because once that, uh, once that uh, statement is read, those people go from, you know, treating you as a brother to the next day treating you as, as you know, as son of Satan, basically. I interviewed a next Mormon named Stan, and he wrote a letter because he wanted to be taken off the, the church rolls of the Mormon church, right? So he wouldn't be counted as a statistic, and it took forever. And they sent him a letter, and they said, uh, this revocation of memberships removes all benefits of baptism, like a threat. <laughs> you know, <laughs> a, well, yeah. big whoop, you know? It's, <laughs> Uh, thanks for the call. Thanks yeah. for listening. Thank you for being a part of the show. It's much appreciated. Anytime, Seth. Y'all have a y'all have a good day. All right. Before I finish up, real fast sure. with the, with you, Nate. Let's squeeze in one more. Been on hold very patiently. Four one five. You're on the Thinking Atheist podcast. Who's this? Hi. This is Mo. How you doing? I'm good. What's going on? Well, um, I was uh, I was curious to talk to Nate about um, how uh, how it is that extracts oneself from such a pervasive mindset. I mean, I grew up in uh, a really um, heavily psychologically abusive home myself. Um, it wasn't physically abusive, but it was uh, it was psychologically and emotionally abusive. And, you know, kind of like what Nate was saying, I grew up in it and I didn't know any different. So I just thought that was normal until I started looking around and seeing what, uh, you know, what other kids were growing up in. And, I, you know, I, I started think, thinking that things could be different. Um, so I, I wanted to ask Nate, what do you think it is that um, makes somebody uh, able to get away from that? I mean, what set to you apart from your sister Shirley, for example? Well, that's, see, that's the million-dollar question, and I, and I don't know that I have an absolute answer to that. I think it's a lot of things. I think um, there was a part of me from the time I was a young child who was critical of of uh, my father's hypocrisy, who wanted my own independence, who uh, was asking questions, even if it was just to myself, about how some of the things he taught could be possible. I was always looking for evidence. 
And I think a lot of that, you could say that speaks to some kind of genetic component. I, you know, I don't know. Um, I think how comfortable I was overall in that environment, um, which, you know, is kind of a s- cycling back around to the question of whether or not you can embrace the ideas that are there to begin with. Um, I also think that the fact that I was at odds with my father so much gave me the motivation to uh, go out and search for different answers. So it, it's a tough question. I do know that it took me years of, of uh, you know, counseling with the psychologists. I actually spent time with a psychologist that had also a theology degree, and he put me through about it what amounted to about two years worth of, of uh, seminary training to help me understand that aspect, aspect of it a little bit more. So um, it's just been taking years of, of really challenging the ideas and, and the thoughts that I came away from that place with. That's a good answer. <laughs> thank you so much. I yeah, I can, I can imagine that. But thank you so much for talking about your story. It's an inspiration to people like us. Thanks so much. Bye. It's funny, Nate. I ask everybody in the chat room to describe you in one word, and it's brave, courageous, amazing, brave, resilient, brave, smart, brave. And then one guy said hammered. (laughs) (laughs) So apparently you sound sound pretty relaxed on the air there, Nate. I I am so glad to have had the last hour and whatever to, to chat with you. L- let's move forward real fast and talk about what you are doing. There's somebody who maybe wants to go deeper to know your story. I heard a rumor you were writing a book. Is that accurate or is it already, already out? What, do you, what are you up to? Yeah, I'm still working on the book. Um, actually working on trying to find someone to publish it. And I'm, I'm uh, running the, uh, the Calgary branch of the Center for Inquiry up here which is uh, a lot of fun. It's quite a challenge. We've been able to get some really amazing speakers up here, and we're actually doing a, for the first time ever, we're doing a skeptical uh, music and and comedy festival up here next month. And then I'm doing a lot of traveling around, um, giving talks. I'm in Montreal this weekend to give a talk uh, in conjunction with their Pride Week. And, uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. You know, you lost one family, Nate, but man, you gained a much, much bigger one. You know, you, you, you yeah. got people, people love you. When, when I talk about you, it's, and, and the same is true with some of the other people that I've been fortunate enough to, to interact with. I talked to Aaron Ra and some of these people and people love them. They, they just connect in so many amazing ways to their story, to their courage, to the fact that they, maybe they have a similar background, uh, it's helped them in some way or someone they know people love you, man. It, it's awesome. And I'm so excited to see the work you're doing. Nate Phelps, P H E L P S Nate Phelps dot com is his website. Very much appreciated and all my best to you and yours. Okay. Thanks very much. Uh, take care. Follow the thinking atheist on Facebook and Twitter. Watch dozens of original videos on the thinking atheist YouTube channel. And visit our website for resources, links, contact information, the editor's blog, and more. TheThinkingAtheist.com